Now it's my privilege um, to introduce um, Natalie Dutoy, um, our guest speaker for this afternoon. You know, when I think about, and, and as, as I watched Natalie as a young person and watched her grow in, and, and watched her swim, I never thought that I'll sit here today in conversation with you today, Natalie. So it's such a joy to do that. Um, and you can't believe my colleagues behind the scenes asked, how did you get it right? I'll, I'll let them know the magic sauce later. But one of the things that I love about your, 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 your story, Natalie, is that you're a living exemplar of tenacity and the triumph of the human spirit in the face of adversity. Now, Natalie, at the age of 17, met with a car accident. As a result of, of that, her left leg was amputated at the knee. This, however, did not dampen a desire to reach her dreams. Three months after the accident, she began swimming again. And with the goal of competing in the Commonwealth Games and the Olympics thereafter. At 18 years old, as a swimmer, she competed in the 2001 Manchester Commonwealth Games. She smashed the multi-disability 100 meter freestyle as well as the multi-disability 50 meter freestyle records. In addition to breaking records, Dutoy made history. She became the first disabled athlete to qualify for the 800 meter able-bodied freestyle final event. To top it all, in 2004, Natalie participated in the Paralympics in Athens. She won five gold medals and one silver medal. At the same event, she was nominated and received, later in that year, the Laureus World Sports Person of the Year Award. Now, with achievements like that, it tells me something about the person in, our, in the room today. Today, Natalie is a role model beyond the world of swimming. She speaks often at schools, companies, churches, all across the country. And today, we cannot wait to hear you speak, and Natalie, and share your story. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Solon, for that introduction. And thank you to the School Leadership Forum um, and this platform for the ability to be a part of something so special. I, what I would like to do is start off with just a question. And if you can, just throw some words out there um, on the chat to everyone, um, if possible, that we can all see what your answers are. Um, the question is, what has kept you motivated? So I'll type the question, but what has kept you motivated? All right, I'll go first. My faith has kept me motivated. I believe in God and I believe he's got great plans for me. Okay. For me, the, the tenacity of all South Africans. Okay, tenacity. Someone else? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I speak? Absolutely. Um, Edna Frankel, I uh, also am grateful to God and I cannot retire until every child and adult can read. That's what keeps me going. Wow, that is quite a, a big task ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> we run the Read You Care Trust and, and and we teach children and adults how to teach reading to children and adults. Oh, wow. Definitely a skill that's, that's needed and very important. So congratulations on that. And I think we wish you well with that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there good anyone afternoon. else? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Good afternoon. It's Malose Hanaka here at Malagabim Primary School as a principal of Malakabem Primary School in the Free State. The little ones that I always see who comes to school every morning. So since June, the cold times when our COVID-19 was at the highest 
So those little ones who kept coming to school are the ones who motivated me and are still motivating me. So basically the school community at large motivates me a lot. Thank you. Wow, great. And sure, well done to, to all those teachers, principals for you know, being at the schools, so I think through the challenging times is definitely something that has, you know, caught the country and, and the world by storm. So, you know, we, we definitely do take our hats off to you. So thank you very much. Thank is you. There... Um, can, can I speak now or Mr. Wilson, do you want to go first? Yes, let me go first. Okay, uh, I'll go second. Natalie, uh, what keeps me motivated is the love of working with the kids uh, I'm, I'm working here with kids from the age of nine to the age of 13 years old. The, and also the support that I get to, to the teachers that I'm working with, and also the support groups like the school governing body, and also the parents of learners that were teaching they are very supportive to the school programs and activities. Thank you so much. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Rubisha de Force. I'm a business leader and I love children dearly. I have a disabled son and he keeps me motivated. He let me learn for the first time when he was born to keep faith and never lose it. But um, currently what I'm busy with now is with Vodacom. So I'm busy nego uh, negotiate with them to have for a school um, a fun day or maybe they can have packages and everything. And currently I'm busy negotiate with Vodacom for that. And uh, I have a travel agency, but currently COVID-19 is extremely active for us. So I changed my portfolio. No, I just added. So I'm doing traveling and transportation as well. So with all these aspects, um, I told myself never to give up. Always try another thing and see how it's gonna work in the future. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think, uh, you know, being sort of the younger generation, I think it's also thinking, you know, what can we do? How many, you know, balls can we, can we juggle um, to try and get things done? And let me not say it's not just the younger generation, but I, it's everyone. Um, and I think that's sort of the times and what the times are calling for. So we wish you well with that. And sure, congratulations as well. And is there anyone else that would like to okay. share what keeps them motivated? Yeah. Yes, it's me. I'm Slondile Nshongo from Lions River Primary School, uh, outside Howick in the KZN. Uh, what keeps me motivated is going to a um, school that is now growing and used to be a very small school. And the support of learners and parents who are making it grow. And there are happy faces when we come as teachers and the support of the staff in teaching these learners. And also to make this school grow, I'm very grateful because of the help of some organizations that I work with, like Michael House, um, NRTC, and even the Department of Education I can mention, but I, uh, the ones that I mentioned before, they have played a huge role in growing that school to a positive place because it was a very small farm school and now it's growing to be better and bigger. I'm very grateful, that makes me happy. I wake up early as I, I make sure that I'm at school at seven in the morning because I want to see everyone come in be like after I've been there already because it makes me happy to see that everyone is there and everyone is happy. Well, thank you very much. I think if we can take one or two more um, and then, yes, then we can get into, into the talk and then there'll be a question at the end as well um, after the talk <laughs> just to see how things have changed. Yes, I see a hand up. That's Armstrong. Yes. Sir. yes. Uh, thanks, Natalie. It's a, pri a great pri a privilege for me um, to 
really have this kind of an interaction, which I never thought of it will happen any day soon, but it happened in 2020. You know, uh, I'm new in the PFP, uh, I'm three months into it, and then there's so much that I'm, 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 I'm gathering. So regarding your question, what motivates me, you know, uh, in simple terms, because I'm trying to condense it all into one major objective as to the mission of my life seemingly um, is realized when somebody's life is transformed. With the little support that I give to a person, whether giving the person information and then a person from that legal information or legal support that I'm giving, the person does wonders or miracles with that. To me, that's that's fundamental. When, as a leader, I'm a, I'm a principal at a primary school. I started this year in June, so I've been you know working as a teacher at different level, lower levels. But this this now it's it's saying to me, you have a mission to accomplish, produce leaders. If I can see myself producing leaders, I'll be very happy. In different levels, yes, leaders like in um, even in the school governing body, training them here and there, and then also guiding them with whatever that they have to do, and seeing them improving and doing things properly. To me, that's very, very important. I feel satisfied and fulfilled in one way or the other. That's very, very, it's not necessarily about me, but it's about me giving support to somebody else and seeing transformation in that person's life. That's fundamental. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hi. What keeps, hi, what keeps me motivated? Um, you, you know, when we started, when the schools reopened in June, everybody's spirit was down. But what keeps me motivated is uh, how I see my colleagues, the way they have grown in terms of making sure that whatever challenge that they're meeting, they always have a way to solve that challenge. And that skill I've learned from PFP, every time we come from the meeting or from COP, from PFP, when I share with them the, 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 the challenge, I mean, when I share with them the strategies and they put that in practice and that motivates me a lot. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think, you know, we've heard from um, from some of us that, you know, shared where we work, what we're doing, also shared some ideas. And I think if I could sum it all up, um, a lot of us are inspired because we're able to help. A lot of us are inspired because we can change. A lot of us are inspired by others um, and we learn and we grow and that becomes our network as well. So this is just the start. Um, and I'd like to maybe put it you know, something out there to everybody. And that is for the next month, just if one day, every day or every second day, every third day, just write one word that motivated you that day. Um, one word that something that you're grateful for. Um, just at the end of the day, as you're lying in bed, even if you just think of it, um, it's just something to, to keep us motivated and keep, keep us positive um, throughout this journey. Just recently, um, we've actually gone through this process where every day we just, just to add that one thing that's grateful. And by the end of the week, you actually realize, wow, there's so much more than what I actually thought was, was positive, or that, what, what was happening in the, the rest of the world and what we see in the news, what we see on social media. So I think that's where I would like to start. And I'm going to take you all the way back. I'm going to try and share my screen first. Um, and I think, you know, with the title of um, speaking about adversity, the title speaking about facing adversity, I thought to take you right back to when I was a child and, and when I was growing up. Um, some thoughts that came to mind were that I had no understanding of what adversity meant, what leadership meant. I had no idea of what challenges my family was facing. I was young. Um, I was caught up in school and all the things that we do um, as part of our world. Now, a lot of you teach young kids. A lot of you teach children. Um, and I must admit that I was young. I was naive and not young and naive in terms of, of the naughty things that one can get up to. 
but I think it just in terms of you know what, what my family how wealthy my family was or you know my friends what their families were like um, I fast forward a few years and boy did I start to see some challenges in life and I prefer to call them challenges and not obstacles for the mere fact that challenges seem a lot more positive than what obstacles do so you see, growing up, I think a lot of kids are defined by who their parents are, um, what schools they go to, and the circumstances that they find themselves in, and often are labeled. So I know that growing up, I was labeled, um, and I think throughout life, I've, I've also become labeled. Um, very fortunate, though, that not just labeled as a disabled person, but that people saw past the disability and actually saw me for a for who I was. Um, actually, the complete opposite, because a lot of people say that, why am I swimming disabled when I'm not really disabled? So I think, you know, that's that's something that can that shows that that life can be really positive. But what I wanted to share was growing up, you don't really see that. Um, you know, kids are in it, but they don't see the differences generally compared to those that you know, once you get older and you've gone through one or two obstacles, you're able to see that. So in the presentation um, is actually a video and the video describes um, a competition that I was competing in. It is my Olympic trials and it was the race that I swam in and I qualified for the Olympic games in. It was in Seville, as I mentioned, and we arrived there the night before, our luggage was lost. And thank goodness I had my swimming suit in my backpack um, and I had some gels that I could feed on um, or feed with. And, you know, that was how we had to prepare for the race. Our luggage arrived very early that morning, so we were up for many, many hours. But ultimately, many, many challenges uh, were faced the day before our race. And you wake up on the day of your race and you think, this is it. This is the only chance I have to achieve um, my Olympic dreams. So the race goes, and you would have followed me with the yellow cap, um, swimming 10 kilometers. It takes two hours to swim. Now I wouldn't have shown you the whole two hours of the race. But what is in the race in open water is that everyone, there's 52 people that literally swim together. And with that, there's a lot of hitting. There's a lot of pulling, um, a lot of trying to slow your competitor down. And everyone swims right, right next to each other. So. It is about being able to stay calm and being able to swim a race that you have trained for, that you have practiced for, for so long. Uh, so it was coming into the last channel of the last uh, 50 meters through what we call lane ropes. And you can see the finish in front of you. And I just realized I was top four and I'd been sprinting for probably the last uh, two and a half, three kilometers. And with that, touching the touchpad and placing fourth, just just behind the third place and it didn't matter because ultimately i wasn't third i didn't win a medal but i was top 10 and i'd qualified for the olympic games or my olympic dream so you paint a picture of you know growing up and not really understanding you paint a picture of of qualifying for that olympic games and the negatives to the positives so if i move on to um, you know, just taking us back to when I was six years old, when I was growing up, um, I was this little girl that, you know, I just loved swimming at the age of six. I absolutely hated it before that, but I got into the swimming pool and, um, you know, I just took off and I just loved what I was doing. And I swam with a lot of the older kids because my parents couldn't drive back and forth to the swimming pool. We didn't have enough money for petrol, etc. So, I got into the swimming pool with my brother and he's three years older than me. So I started training with him and started swimming with him. And I don't think he liked that very much, but nevertheless, um, you know, we were siblings and I was tired of sitting on the side of the pool and actually watching um, everything that he was doing. And, you know, just loved what I did. And I swam a competition, a school's competition, actually, every year we swam a club competition every week, um, mostly at Newlands in Cape Town. So if anybody knows Newlands Swimming Pool in Cape Town, it's in the open, it's, it's uh, 50 meters, it's freezing cold in winter, 
but we swam there. And that was what we needed to do just to be able to compete. And that was what life was for me. I loved what I was doing um, and loved everything about it. Now, I was 12 years old, so I fast forward about six years. And at the age of 12, I qualified for my first international tour to go to Crystal Palace in London. Now, I, my parents couldn't really afford it. So one of the parents um, of the children that also qualified offered to pay for half my ticket. And my parents said, okay, well, we'll try and find the other half. For pocket money, um, very much like raffles at school, I walked down the main road in Cape Town and I went and looked for any donations possible. I happened to walk into Inner Parman's factory shop uh, just down the road from where I lived. And I got a five rand donation, which later on in my life, I realized that I think it was just from the lady, the lady receptionist, um, not actually from the company. Uh, but, you know, in, as a young girl and as 12 years old, any donations helped and any donations was helping me get to, to the UK. So I was 12, I made my first team and I was going to Crystal Palace. My parents weren't coming with me. We were going with the team and we arrived there a day before the time. We saw these most amazing facilities that we don't have here in South Africa. And it was just a complete eye opener. We competed um, and I happened to win a couple of medals. I won the Victrix Adorum and I came back to South Africa. And I think with the mentality that I needed to always be the best to be able to achieve anything. Um, it, was, it was tough. My parents tried everything for me to try and get uh, the best opportunities possible, sometimes not always possible, but ultimately I just tried my best. And I think the question that I asked you at the beginning was, you know, about, um, you know, what keeps you motivated is to remind you every day that although we're going through these challenges, one can stay positive. Now, at 12, I didn't think like this, but that's where sport came in. Sport was my motivation. I loved it. I got into the water. I could forget about all the challenges in the world. Um, you know, some days I swam really badly. And I got out the swimming pool and thought, you know, why am I doing this? And other days I got into the swimming pool and others motivated me. An interesting fact is we've asked a number of top athletes what motivates them. And they said the fact that people said to them they couldn't achieve it. And that was what kept them motivated to go on and achieve it. Now, back in South Africa, as I mentioned, from 1996, from Crystal Palace in London, and I start training again. I'm now 14 years old and I moved from my little coach that I was training with. So I was training five one hour sessions a week. I know nowadays at the age of 12, the children are already uh, training about four hours a day, three to four hours a day in the swimming pool. So life has become a lot more competitive. It's become more challenging in terms of putting hours in and trying to achieve as well. So I was 14 when I started training three hours, uh, three times a week and two hours twice a week. I moved to a senior coach who spoke Hungarian and I didn't really understand his accent. So I asked a lot of questions and naturally that's who I am. And I used to get shouted at quite a lot for asking so many questions or the comments that would follow our um, are you going to ask another stupid question? Um, but I would ask it anyway. And I'm sure a lot of you can, um, can understand what I'm saying. However, I never, ever let that stop me. And I started training. Um, I started doing better. I started winning competitions against senior girls. And we went off to our national championships in um, Durban. And it was the 400 meter individual medley. I was racing a girl that was probably about 10, 12 years my senior. And my coach said to me, Natalie, you can do this. You can beat her and you can qualify for the Commonwealth Games. And I don't think I really knew what it was like to, to beat someone or to try and beat someone. Um, it was just about, you know what, I'm gonna get up on that block and I'm going to give my all. I'm gonna give everything that I've worked hard for for the past few years. And I got up on the block and the starting gun went off and I dived into the swimming pool. Two lengths of every stroke, two lengths butterfly, two lengths backstroke, two lengths breaststroke, two lengths freestyle. 
it's just under five minutes of a race and we had come to the butterfly I was behind the backstroke I was a little further behind breaststroke I started catching up and freestyle the first tumble turn came ahead and we tumble turned at the same time and I looked in the same direction as the girl and with that um, it was kind of like we are racing for home and we raced the last 50 meters. I remember my coach drilling into my head that you don't breathe from when you see the flags to the wall. So it's the last five meters. And I was exhausted. So I breathed up until the flags, absolutely every stroke. And when I got to the flags, I put my head down and I hit the wall as hard as I could. And I looked up and I'm short sighted. So I didn't see too much at first, but realized that I'd beaten the goal by a couple of split seconds. And even then it hadn't sunk in that hang on, I was number one, but also I qualified um, for the Commonwealth Games, which was the senior team. At the end of the competition, everyone congratulates you, you stand on their shoulders and your name is announced as part of Team South Africa. This was my first Team South Africa I'd be going to. And with that, the naming um, and calling out, there was a lot of negative talk. There was a lot of media that said, I shouldn't be going because I was too young that the other girl was a lot more experienced and you know she was only a few split seconds behind me therefore she should be going and i must admit that it it kind of hits a little bit but it didn't hit that much because i had qualified i had worked so hard and i was going to the commonwealth games in kuala lumpur in 1998 and off we went to kuala lumpur later that year and competing um, the first day i was busy warming up and I got out the water and I went and I heard my name over the loudspeaker. I went up to my coach and I said to him, Karoli, they're calling me on the speaker. I think I've just missed my race. And he said to me, Nat Nata, what are you talking about? I said, well, my race is happening and I'm not in it. And it was a pure error of just being in the warm up pool and not calculating time properly. And with that, a lot of media said I was in the bathroom. I was, you know, busy with boys. And I was in those days, we were actually sort of wrapped over the knuckles and I had to go and apologize to the starters, to the officials, because if you miss your race, it's seeing as though you're trying to put your competitors off and it's extremely rude. And I apologized in writing, I apologized in person and they said to me, they'd only let me know the next day if I'd be able to compete in the rest of the competition or not. So I came back and I called my mom, one of those reverse call charges and you know she said to me nata what's happened i said but i just missed my race and she said well all these really bad stories are going around and i said no purely i was just in the warm-up pool and and swimming and warming up and with that i felt like i had let the whole of the country down i'd let um you know everyone that believed in me everybody that was willing to stand behind me and support me i had let them all down and i think from that day um, and missing my race and going through those negative and, and what we would call challenges or obstacles, not doing well, coming back to South Africa, um, I didn't want to go back to swimming. And all I knew was that I needed to, because without training, without putting the hours in, I wouldn't be anywhere. And until I had made up my mind 100%, I was going to get back into the pool and I was going to start swimming. No matter how many times my coach said to me, Natalie, you're still so young. You have so many years ahead of you. You have so many Commonwealth Games, Olympics. You're so young, just keep going. Um, you know, it was up until the day that I decided for myself that I was gonna keep going. That was the day that I started loving the sport again and started doing well again. And I think at 14 and 15, one doesn't really realize it. And it took me over a year to come through that but it was something that I came through um, and came to the other end. I was 2000, it was year 2000 and it was the Olympic trials and again, our national championships. And my coach said to me, Natalie, you've got four chances. By the third chance I'd missed out by the Olympic qualifying by just over a few seconds. And he said to me, Natalie, this is your last chance. It was the 200 meter individual medley and all he said to me was, put your head down and you do absolutely everything that you can to get to the, to the other end and to qualify. I swam the first length butterfly, second length backstroke, breaststroke, freestyle, I touched the touch pad, I looked up, 
I'd miss qualifying by 0 0.03 of a second. <laughs> now, if anybody's ever used a stopwatch, um, try and, and stop it, start and stop it at 0 0.03. And again, you know, within two years, it is a challenge or an obstacle. It is something that one has to deal with, one has to face with. And I'd worked for four years to try and get to qualify for the Olympic Games. The next Olympic Games are in another four years time. So ultimately, I have to work another four years for that. Is that possible? Is that something I can do? And those are questions that, you know, go around in your head. You're training three hours, four hours a day. Is it worth it? You know, being at school, I played every sport possible as well because I love playing sport. I was the athlete at the athletics track when we had inter-house athletics that nobody put up their hand for the long distance. So Natalie's name was added to the long distance or the sprints or whatever I needed to do. But I loved it because the more I was busy, the more I, I felt good. It's what motivated me. And I think early on, you realize often what motivates you and what keeps you going. It is the reason why at every single swimming gala, I used to swim every event possible, just so that I didn't have to sit down and have to wait for everyone else. So I generally swam every race. Yes, you have the parents that say, she's gonna burn out. Um, you know, it's, don't push your child so hard. I remember my mom coming home crying because parents were so nasty to her because I just wanted to swim every race possible and she took the brunt of it. So one has to also remember that it's not just your life, but it's your family's lives around you that are also, um, you know, that people also have an effect on it. And they also suffer from a lot of things or they go through the positives. Now I talk about, you know, being 16, um, I've now changed three schools purely on scholarships. And I'm now at one of the schools that I wanted to be at. And we used to train an hour, three times a week during school. And we used to train at Paulsmore Prison in their swimming pool because we didn't have a swimming pool at school. So all I remember is there not being no lines on that swimming pool and the sun used to bear down on us and our coach used to have to make us do these tumble turns and we could never judge these walls because there were no lines on the swimming pool. And so again, you know, one learns the lessons of being able to trust yourself, being able to trust what you need to do in that swimming pool and that, you know, once you trained, you will know when to tumble turn without physically having to count your strokes. Um, I know a lot of teachers teach their children to, to count strokes in the swimming pool. So growing up, I have a lot of fond memories of, of being in school. Um, you know, my swimming was also a bit of an excuse to sometimes be late. I used to be able to sit and eat my lunch in the first period. So again, you know, those are, are fond memories. Um, I sometimes got away with a little too much, but sometimes, um, you know, I was also told that I, I can't. So ultimately it's, it's positive and it's negative. But at the end of the day, when you walk away, you, I still had an education. Um, I was still given that opportunity, even though I wasn't really at school very much, especially in the last three years of my life, um, of my schooling career, not my life. But, um, you know, being at school for two to three months in the last three years of my schooling, my aim was just really to, to pass, um, but because it was important. And uh, in my generation, a lot of the kids didn't finish matric. Nowadays, it has become very important for every child to finish matric and go on and study. I left school and uh, I was 17 years old. I started university. However, I wasn't really there, so I really struggled. Um, and I'm talking 2001 now, so I'm 17 years old, and I was involved in a motorbike accident, and I lost my leg through the knee. Now, the accident happened, it was a freak accident, and ultimately I was driving on my way from school to, uh, from training to school, and I was approaching a stop street when a car took a shortcut through a parking area, and just exited the parking area and drove straight into me. Now my leg took the brunt of the accident and because of that it sort of burst as if you drop a tomato on the ground. Obviously the hospital tried to save it, the doctors tried to save it and I was in ICU for a week, um, went through 24 units of blood to try and save my leg. They realized that I was an athlete, I was a swimmer um, because my coach and all my swimming friends came to visit me in hospital. But other than that, you know, a lot of those that came to visit me in hospital were sad 
um, my parents had managed to get some disabled um, people to come and speak to me in hospital. And with that, a lot of them were extremely negative about something that's happened. And because everyone was extremely negative, I had one person that stood out. And that individual was a gentleman. He was extremely tall. He walked in and I had not seen a disability at all on him. Um, he sat down and he started telling me about how he's you know, struggling to run marathons. Um, but once he got training and he got into it, it was really possible. And sitting there, I was still trying to think, what is your disability? Um, and then what he did was he took off his shoe and he was missing the front half of his foot. And, you know, my first thoughts were, but you're missing half a foot and I'm missing half a leg. You can't really compare that at all. <laughs> um, and later on, you realize that no matter what disability you have, you probably have very similar challenges that you go through mentally, um, physically. I also struggled to find shoes to fit my prosthetic foot. I struggled to um, find my balance. He struggled to find his balance. Um, you know, his skin chafed quite a lot and mine chafed quite a lot as well. So ultimately, although we had different body parts, it was very similar situations. And again, one realizes that no matter what you go through, what challenge it is, it is how you handle it, how you deal with it, and how you come through it on the other side. It can take years, can take months, um, and it can take days, but just to keep going until you get through it. I had a lot of psychologists try and come and speak to me in hospital, but I thought my parents needed them a little more than what I did. So I, I sent them along to speak to my parents. And I, you know, again, I say that it's not just about me, but my dad, you know, he's very heart sore that he had bought me the scooter and he blames himself for that as well. My mom wishes that it was her leg and not my leg. So those are challenges that one goes through. Now, I asked you what motivates you purely because at the start, you will share what motivates you, but ultimately others are also motivated by you. So there's always a, a give and a take effect. Um, and as much as I was motivated by my sport, I tried to motivate my family as well, or tried to find things that could motivate them. And that's something that was really important was that we all are motivated so that we could get through this in the best possible time. Now, yes, I was 17 years old and yes, I have some of the answers now. I didn't have them back then. Back then it was, it was tough. Um, took me quite a long time to come through. Um, you know, I got back into the waters as quickly as I could. I got to swimming. I had a lot of scars that still needed to heal. So I swam before I started walking and being able to what we call weight bear. So actually putting the weight on, on my stump. Because I got into the water almost uh, just three months afterwards, I still remembered what it felt like. My leg wasn't there and breaststroke, I started swimming in a circle, which was not the best. I got a few black eyes and gave a few people stitches because I used to swim into them and they used to cut their eyes with their goggles. But those are all things that one remembers. And even though it's challenging times, there's some real things that you can laugh at, at afterwards. You know, when it's happening, it's not so funny. But that year was an interesting year. I went back to um, university. I had a lot of friends that, um, you know, tried to help me. Um, I was on crutches at that stage. And ultimately, you know, they tried to carry my bags. Um, and I think for me, it was important to be able to do things myself and get back to life as as life was. What was life? It was swimming, it was school, it was just keeping busy and trying to just do absolutely everything. So you'll always be grateful for those that help you through those challenges and, and challenging moments um, that get you through the negative. And again, I think fortunately, I had an accident. A lot of people say that it's something that's negative, but it actually was something really positive within my life as well. I started being able to do speaking. I started um, you know, earning some money that way and, and being able to pay for things, um, pay for tours, pay for you know, some household things. Um, I, I've met people that became a big part of my team. And one realizes throughout life that you can't do anything without your team. Even if it's one person, two people, three people, to have that person in your corner that fights for you. When I was disabled and I started swimming again, 
the disability sector section of swimming was very different to the able-bodied and the disability side of it said that I hadn't paid for my yearly fees so I wasn't allowed to compete internationally and it took an individual to come in and say but how much is it then we'll pay it and then we can do the international competitions because it's only been a few months and nobody's told us about this um, how do you belong to a disabled club when you don't know that you need to be able to belong to one um, so again you know those are, are the types of partnerships the types of you know, people around you that one gathers. I'm very fortunate that I had that ability to gather um, people who became part of my team and became close to me and allowed me to achieve what I was able to achieve in the end. So again, you know, going through an accident, losing a limb, for me was really positive. And yes, I wake up every morning, sometimes I forget, I fall out the bed. Um, sometimes I remember that I don't have a leg and I have to put my leg on. But ultimately, every morning I wake up, I have to put a prosthesis on. So every morning I wake up, I go through the day, I go through the accident, I go through not having a leg. Recently, I've been given the opportunity to learn how to run again. And I, you know, after 18 years, one doesn't remember what your leg must do, what your hands must do. So I looked really interesting in the beginning of learning how to run again. But I want to bring you back to the age of 17, an accident, losing a leg, going through these challenges. How did I cope? I threw myself into work. I threw myself into swimming and I got back to where I wanted to be, what, what I wanted to achieve. It was the goal of going to the Olympic Games. Did I know that I could do it? Absolutely not. Did I know that it would take me another number of years to get there? I had no idea. But the choice was that I was going to train, that I was going to work hard and see where it takes me. I always said that I wanted to retire at the age of 28. So I still had a number of years to go from the age of 17 um, to 28. And I was going to keep on until I was 28 and knew that I've given everything. I've spent the most time possible. And I know that my body physically couldn't give any more or do any more. By that stage, I would leave the sport and and go on and do something else so i'm going to fast forward again because my life goes through many years <laughs> and many challenges but as yours does and as you will also go through with your children at school um, and those children that you try and help and that you look after and often you feel that that is your life as well so you take on other lives while you're busy living your life i fast forward to a quote that i want to share with you and I'm going to read this quote. It says, sometimes in life, you come up against a wall. You can stop at the wall, but then nothing more will happen. You can try to turn at the wall, but if you come out of that spin without purpose, you'll be disorientated and may lose your way. Or you can choose to tumble turn at the wall, picking a new direction and using the impetus the wall provides to propel you forwards in life. Now, using a swimming analogy to explain the different parts to life. And when you swim and you do the tumble turn, you kind of realize that you have those three options. So fast forwarding to my most exciting moment in 2007, I shared a little bit about Seville already. Seville was a very interesting swim. And I'm gonna take you through my day because I think you would understand it a little better. My cap was not the correct cap. I had different logos that I shouldn't have had on it that wasn't allowed. And with that, we had to write in letters um, my number and the country that I swam for. I swam in a new costume. One never swims in a new costume in a major race because it can be too tight. It can also split, you never know. So hope you should have warmed up in it at least. The race started um, on the pontoon and the pontoon was plastic containers, so it moves. And just before the race, I take my leg off and I sit down. And when the gun is ready to go off, that's when I stand. If I fall into the water, I'm disqualified. So I have to be very careful of that. I'd organized for my feeder to be on the pontoon. Very positively, I was chosen as number 52. So I lined up and I was the last person on the end of the line which meant that when the gun went off, 
I didn't get caught up in the middle because we all dive and the pontoon moves and you dive in on top of one another, basically. So I could dive wide away from everybody and choose to stay away from the, the pack um, and move closer to the pack when I felt um, I should move closer to the pack. Going into a race with everybody, I had to know my weaknesses. I had to know that ultimately I cannot pick up speed at the race that everyone else picks up speed. What does that mean? It means that I have to sprint and give it my absolutely everything from way before everybody else does just to be able to keep up with them. But it's okay because I knew that and I trained for it. It was two hours of a race. I had to know that I'd eaten enough and eaten properly beforehand. I'd fueled well and that I had fuel if I needed to. Now I raced with Coke and uh, some rehydrate as well. Uh, Coke, especially when you get tired and you need some sugar. Um, I don't recommend for all athletes to do that, but ultimately it was what I was used to and what I was going to do. My race dived in and I came into the pack, I think halfway through the first lap and the race was just a perfect race. I didn't get hit. I didn't get kicked. Actually, what happened was the, the third two and a half kilometers, I went around the turn and I realized that something must have happened to a lot of the, the swimmers behind me. And actually there was a num I think there was about eight of us that had pulled away. And from that, four of us had pulled away. So the last two and a half kilometers, all I knew was that I put my head down and I swim as hard as I can. That means thrashing my arms as much as I could, thrashing my legs, um, making sure that I sight, that I see the line well, um, that I sit and try and stay with the leaders as much as possible. Very much like a bird flies, you'll see packs, flocks of birds flying. They fly in a V formation. In swimming, you also try and stay in that V formation so that you can get some of the slipstream from the swimmer in front of you. So that's all things that were going through my head, trying to be technical, trying to you know, just be this top 10 in the world because that was my, my qualification. Not top 10 in South Africa, but in the world. And touching the touch pad and climbing out, I was 24 when I qualified. And if I take you back to my start of my talk, I was six when I started. So after so many years, after all those challenges, one eventually achieves a dream, a lifelong dream that had been set from when I was a little girl. And it was, I think, the, the tip of the iceberg. It was absolutely everything um, just to be able to qualify. And now you have a few months that now you have to train. You're really excited. You don't know what you're going to do. So you get into the pool and you try the best that you can. Um, and again, you know, you go off to Beijing. It is hot. I try to go to saunas, steam rooms, because I don't do the heat very well. Um, growing up in Cape Town, it's more cold than anything. And ultimately, I got to Beijing and I struggled. We swam in the Shunyi Basin. The Shinyi Basin had lots of mirrors at the bottom. The water was over 30 degrees, outside was over 40 degrees, and it was just not my kind of weather. And I just knew that it wouldn't be my race either. So coming from Seville and, and the highlight of my career to coming to the Olympic Games where the race started and I swam into the first boy, my cap came off. I had very long hair, so I tried to catch up time and you know tried to catch the pack that I'd lost. And ultimately it was very interesting. It was a very interesting race. By three quarters of the race, all I had in my head was I need to finish this race. So from doing so well to having the thought of all I need to do is finish this race, very different thoughts. But at the end of the day, it was success for me because I qualified for the Olympic games and success to me was just doing the best that I could do. I had my mom out there, um, she was in Beijing for two days and she managed to get me get to see me swim. It's the first time ever that she saw me compete outside of, of Cape Town, um, outside of South Africa. And it was really a special moment. And even though it was probably the worst race of my entire career, it was mine and I had to own it. And I had to wait till the Paralympics, which would take place just two weeks later. I went off to the Paralympic Games, um, didn't want to be there and didn't know how I would compete because I hadn't trained for the month between the Olympics and the Paralympics. There was no swimming pool close to me. And I was up in a hotel in some strange place. Um, 
and first day of competition arrived and it was the first race. And I remember the last thing that was said to me was, Natalie, you've got this, you can do this. It's sprinting events, you just give absolutely everything that you have. I got up on the starting block, it was the butterfly event and I dived into the swimming pool and I just remember giving absolutely everything. By the last 20 meters, I wasn't on top of the water anymore. And with that, I touched the touch pad and I looked up and I'd swum my best ever possible time. And a lesson was learned that day because ultimately when one thinks that you're doing the worst and yet your worst fitness is actually when you could possibly be at your best um, in the competition. And again, you know, that sets you up for the whole competition. And I swam extremely well for the rest of the competition. So through life and through these many years, the positives, the negatives, I got to learn a little bit about myself. I got to learn how I handle things. Um, I had people point out to me that I really shouldn't block everything out, that I should start thinking and start, you know, seeing everything that I was doing. And ultimately, it was probably the setup of my life. I left swimming and I went into business and I thought that, you know, I was just going to move on. And a lot of people saw me as the swimmer and still see me as the swimmer. And one has to understand that that is who you are. That is what has made me who I am today. So I want to take you through some of the values that I've learned throughout my life. Hard work, teamwork, respect or perseverance, belief, lots of self-doubt. And again, when you have self-doubt, your team is positive and, you know, they can take a lot of that slack when you're struggling. Goals and dreams to set those. Goals for me are short-term and dreams are long-term. To guard against arrogance. You know, one learns that it's always the person who wants it the most and has worked the hardest that will actually achieve it. To be prepared for anything that happens. To have the want, to have the passion, or the determination or the drive. And then again, obstacles and challenges. Open water race is two hours, it's four laps of two and a half kilometers. Anyone can elbow you, punch you, you can have a blue eye, you can have a leaking goggle, a cap off, and you can be off course, you have to find your way. And ultimately, you have to choose the race that you want to swim. You have to be prepared for that moment that someone punches you or elbows you. It's not really allowed to happen because there are officials on the water and they do blow you if if someone does it. But generally, it happens when nobody's looking. And you have to be prepared for that. You mustn't panic. You just need to go through it. So advice I was given. Change happens if you want it to or not. I learned the quicker you try and align yourself, the quicker it is that you'd make a success of what happens around you. So to learn those lessons in life and move forward. And again, we all go through adversity. I shared a story of swimming, but in life we go through similar adversities. I looked up in the dictionary what adversity means, and it says a state of hardship or prolonged difficulty or misfortune. We all have that. And how do we get through that is what is important. So choose your teams wisely and your communities wisely. Now, I want to ask another question. And for those of you, I'm not sure if the chat is working yet. If you have to think of school and 2021, what comes to mind? If you want to share after you've heard my story and you've shared what motivates you, if you think, if you have to think school and 2021, what comes to mind? I think the first thing that came into my mind was success. I think, I think we've, we've had a form of adversity this year, which is I don't know that any of us have been through anything like um, what COVID has thrown at us. And I think the element of um, success in having survived, um, whatever form that might take, and I think going through I think a new a new base has been established. Well one thing that this whole story with COVID has proved that we are all one people and it's, it's just marvelous and, and when we all go back to school and remember 
We are all one people. Regardless of difficulties, etc., we're all God's children. And when when this this virus has flown, we we must continue to live as one people and recognize our, our good and our difficulties and our achievements. And I just want to say, Natalie, I sat with the lump in my throat and my heart over just so warm with admiration and thank you for your wonderful example to all of us. All the very best in all you do. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, embracing technology is something that is, is really positive as well, you know, and, and it's looking at to be one in a slightly different way um, and opening horizons to, to what's new um, and what's out there as well and, and the way that the world is going. So I think there's a lot that, that's still to come. Um, and, and again, to every one of you here, um, you know, it's fantastic for everyone just to come together and, and discuss and, and share. Um, because that's also important. Um, we all seem to think that we're going through challenging things, but often we're going through similar um, and sometimes very much the same. And so it's great to know that others have, have similar challenges too. Thanks, Selwyn. Um, you know, I would like to start by saying thank you, Natalie, for sharing your great story of courage um, and then I was saying to my mind, I wonder how you got that mental Pilates, you know? It's like, I don't know what happened to your brain because I think you have the strongest cells there. <laughs> I wonder who fortified that, uh, or maybe it was in your nature, uh, because it shows from the age of six, you were a very brave uh, young girl uh, who would really uh, be adventurous, you know? you swim with your brother, your brother wouldn't really like you there because maybe he would think you were, you were gonna drown and, and cause problems for him, <laughs> something like that. And taking strength from you, when I think of schooling and then 2021 particularly, what comes to mind is that every year in an actual fact is the same because it will not, it will not, it will not be that smooth for for all the months that we, we have to go through. So there are months that are gonna be okay. There are months uh, as an individual where you will find that emotionally you are not doing well. There will also be days where you feel highly motivated and so on. So uh, what I'm taking, or what, what comes to mind is that we, we need to be brave. And, and not panic, as you said, in one of the values that you, you put forth to say, the lessons that you, you, you are uh, drawing from your life story is that everyone will have challenges, which means every year we will have challenges. But does it mean we have to panic and then feel like we must uh, dig the holes and hide ourselves? No, we need to put the brave face and then, and then not panic and then go through the challenges. And it's amazing what lessons then we learn after having gone through the challenges that we can share with other people so that people can see the reason for living, you know, you know so that people cannot just give up easily. You know, if I'm just imagining if you had to give up and say, now I don't have one leg and then I think my life is over. So there's, there's no more reason for me to leave. It, we wouldn't be enjoying this uh, if you were not brave enough. Thank you so much for sharing the day with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And, and absolutely honest, you know, in terms of we're all walking this road together. You know, again, we're all one. And no matter what challenges come at us, there is always, and, and I believe there's always a way in which you can overcome it. It might be you talking to someone and they have the answer. It might be holding someone's hand. It might be, you know, helping someone out. Um, and again, you know, technology has allowed everyone to be here together. So I hope that you're able to share um, contacts and, and cards 
Um, and thank you very much for, for those valuable words that, that's, that you've shared and that everyone has shared. Sure. And I think when I, when I think of school and 2021, I think of the process of schooling as um, unlocking the potential that's, that young people have inside of them. And uh, your story reminds me that as adults and as educators, we must allow people to deal with their own adversity and to allow, give them the space to work through it um, and, and support them. If someone helicoptered in and rescued you every time that you felt unsure mm. or in pain or had had you had to deal with those thoughts you had to go through them and that's what made you stronger and i think in 2021 even now we must know that adversity will always follow us and the children especially who we want to protect against adversity we're not doing them a service when we protect them against adversity but we should be there to guide them through it and to show them that they are strong enough to do that um, I think uh, so, so that, that's a very personal note, simply because um, as a parent or with a young child, I can see that we are not there every day to uh, take care of our children and protect them from everything around them. Uh, our job is to prepare them for life and to show them that they are capable in themselves and they're strong in themselves and that they have the backing they need and the shoulder to cry on when they need it, um, mm. but that even them. I have a little niece and a little nephew and, you know, going back to school, not going back to school and seeing, you know, my little nephew said to me, but my friends don't want to play with me. Um, and then not understanding that, well, actually, nobody could actually be in the vicinity of anybody else. So it was, you know, stay at home and at lockdown and, you know, taking you down to that thinking and that mentality was actually something really special because one realizes, um, you know, how much this period has you know ingrained some adversity within us um i would never have thought that a child would think that their friends had deserted them um and purely because you kept in communication um kept purely because you you know you're also moving with the times i have the technology to be able to to be online um you know there's a lot of kids or, or people that aren't online and you know go through even more challenges so absolutely agree and it's about the processes and it's also as teachers as learners as principals as whatever position we are it's also to try and equip um, as much as possible and as best as possible to those that we are in community with um, so I, I'll share for me you know um, what 2021 has meant is that I must take my experience serious I must be aware of my experiences and then find the time to reflect on them. And 2021, um, in terms of experiences, you know, as um, you, you watch your children go through experiences of, man, can we just get over this? Can we just get over this? There's a fatigue, you know, that settles in. But um, as they go through it, you realize actually what they are yearning for is connection, connection, connection. And I think COVID has taught me the importance of family, the power of family and the power of being together. And I know for many children, initially that was a, a strain but for me, um, the power of taking my experience seriously with being with my family for extended periods of time was amazing. So I loved that, but yet um, I still think there's some fatigue now settling in. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Selwyn. Is there anyone else that would like to share before I wrap up? My part, that is. <laughs> anyone else would like to share? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, so I think just in, in closing off and, and what we've spoken about, we spoke about what motivates you. Um, I shared a story about, um, you know, motivation and just getting through the challenges and, you know, it's going to come, it's going to go um, and it's how you get through it. So I would like you all to take a look 
at who you are and where you would like to go and do this regularly. And it's okay to veer off course slightly. Um, there's no pun with accidents or cars or anything like that, but um, it's okay to wonder a bit, but I want you to take a look at who you are and where you would like to go. Um, and purely because often that also helps the next person and the community and the team around you as well. Once you know where you want to go or what you want to do, um, others are able to also pick up on that and also find their way and encourage others to take a look at where they are and who th and where they would like to go. And then just the last thing, and that says change happens if you want it to or not. So remember that and stay with it, be positive about it. I've never been able to change willingly. Um, it's been very tough for me to do, but it's something that throughout life, I've had to learn to be able to change and change quicker, uh, take less time to, to be resistant um, to it. So just remember change happens if you want it to or not. And thank you very much for the session and I wish you all well. I know that it's coming up to the end of the year, so it's been great for me to be being a part of this, um, especially for you know the next generation of our future. So thank you very much for the opportunity to my school, to to you, Solwyn, and your team, and to the school leadership forum. Thank you so much. Um, I think we could sit for a long while just listening to you leading us into the water and giving us an, an idea of, of what transpires through your journey. And uh, I think from all of us uh, and on behalf of the School Leadership Forum team, we wish you well in your future endeavors. And we hope that we can get you in person at some stage on a platform to speak again. But thank you so much and God bless you in, in your future work. Thank you, Selwyn and the team. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for the... <laughs> Thank you for Thank an you. outstanding afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for a remarkable afternoon. <laughs> See you next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the best to everybody. Yeah. Loving blessings oh. to you all. Oh, this was quite an extreme wow. year for us. Wow. Quite challenging. But uh, we, we've made the poll. And this yeah. uh, Zoom meetings was very great. Yeah, and everything that I get on every meeting it was good advice. And it's nice to learn about everybody's expertise and experiences. Thank you, everyone. A beautiful afternoon indeed. Thanks. See you, Sabrawari. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the year. See you in February. Thanks, Rafiwe. <laughs> okay, bye. I'm going to leave now. So happy new uh, Merry Christmas and happy new year. <laughs> bye bye.